Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day 24 in our 90-day SAT prep series. So today we're going to be spending half an hour with the math section, and then we'll switch over and do half an hour with the writing section. So as far as what we're going to get into today, today we're going to be taking uh, SAT practice test 2. We're going to be going through problems 16 through 20 of the no calculator section, and then we'll do problems 16 through 23 of the math with calculator section. So as I go through, I'll be giving you my tips, tricks, advice, and strategies for the SAT math section for both the no calculator and the with calculator section. And then after that, we'll switch over to the SAT writing section where I'll give you my tips, tricks, advice, and strategies over there. So I'll be telling you things you should put in your notes for the SAT math section. So things uh, that'll save you time, make you more efficient, and overall improve your uh, ability to, your ability and your potential to score highly on the SAT math section. So with that, Let's go and get started with question 16 from SAT practice test 2. So we have the sales manager of a company awarded a total of $3,000 in bonuses to the most productive salespeople. The bonuses were awarded in amounts of $250 or $750. If at least one $250 bonus and at least one $750 bonus were awarded, what is one possible number of $250 bonuses awarded? All right, so the key part here is that we only have to list one possible uh, number of $250 bonuses awarded. Right now, the thing is here that we have to have at least one $750 bonus, okay? So let's say that we have, uh, in this case, I see that my total is going to be $3,000. So I'm just going to try and split this up half and half. So I'll just go ahead and say I have two of those $750 bonuses. So two times 750, that's going to give me 1,500, right? I have 3,000 total. So I do this 3,000 minus 1,500. That's going to leave me with another 1,500. I divide that by that uh, 250, right? Because that's my how much bonuses I have otherwise. So now we have that 1500 divided by that 250, right? So 1500 over 250, right? And we'll see then that when we do that 200, um, I'm sorry, that 1500 over that 250, we're gonna get six, okay? So six is one possible answer choice. Another possible answer choice is three. Okay, we would get three if we were to have three of these $750 bonuses, then we'd only have three of that $250 ones. If we had only one $750 bonus, then we would have nine $250 bonuses. So all of those are acceptable answer choices. Uh, what I did there is I just go ahead and I split it up half and half, okay, because I thought that was going to be easiest. Um, but you could really do it either way. So there's multiple correct answer choices here. You could have six, you could have three, or you could have nine, but those are the only correct answer choices. So you could pick uh, one of those three. Uh, you can get there in different ways. In my opinion, the easiest way was just to split it up half and half, but uh, you may have your own opinion on what's going to be easiest there. So that one, pretty simple. Now we can go ahead and move into 17. All right, so 17, we have in the equation above, A, B, and C are constants. If the equation is true for all values of x, one thing you should put in your notes here is any time that we're told an equation is true for all values of x, it means that those two equations have to equal each other, okay? So if those two equations have to equal each other, that means that my a value here would have to be whatever my a value is in front of x squared. Okay, so whatever's in front of x squared on this side is going to have to be the same as a. Uh, same with b and same with c. All right, so I'm asked for the value of b in this case. So I want to solve for what comes in front of my x on this side over here on my left side. Well, I'm going to have 2x then times this positive 5. That's going to give me 10x. And then I'm going to have a 3 here times a 3x. So that's going to give me plus a 9x, okay, because 3 times 3x gives me 9x. So I see my total there is going to be 19x, okay? I'm asked for the value of b, so I don't have to include x. So b then is just going to equal that 19. So the value of b there is 19. So as far as things you should put in your notes here, one thing I want to point out is that I didn't solve for a or solve for c because I don't need to know that to get to my correct answer, okay? So you only want to solve for variables that will help get you to your correct answer, right? So sometimes that means that you solve for a variable that helps you get rid of three wrong answer choices on the multiple choice section. In this case, there are no... Uh, multiple choice options. So we just want to solve for the only thing that we need to know, which is the value of b. So we don't waste time doing this 2x times 3x because that gives us an x squared, which we don't need to know. So that's one big thing to save time there is not solving for things that we don't need to know, making sure we only solve for the things we do need to know. All right, question 18. In the figure above, AE is parallel to, or I'm sorry, AE is parallel to CD and segment AD intersect CE at B. What is the length of segment CE? All right, so in order to solve for the length of CE, we're going to have to solve for this CB right here, okay? And then we have to add that to 8 to solve for this full C to E. All right, so if we want to do that, what we're looking at then is similar triangles, okay? So we have this angle here where this B is. That's going to have to be the same as this angle here. So these two angles have to be the same. Now, when we know that, and we know that AE is also parallel to CD, 
So since AE is parallel to CD, right, since this line here is parallel to this line, that means that our angle here has to equal, so our angle at D is going to have to equal our angle at A, and our angle at C is going to have to equal our angle at E. So now that we know that, what I'm going to look to do is set up a ratio, okay? So I know that I have A to B, right, A to B right here. I know that that's 10, okay? So that's a 10, right? And I know that that's from my angle where I have two lines to my angle with one line. So I'm going to find my other angle with two lines to my angle with one line, and I see that that is going to be uh, 5, right? I see that I have that from D to B, and I see that that is 5. So I'm going to go ahead and set up this ratio. Now, one thing I want to point out is I want my X, right, for what I'm solving for. In this case, that's C to B. I want that to be up top to make it easier for me to solve. So I can do it in less steps, okay? So I see that that's on my smaller triangle. So then I want my fraction from my smaller triangle, so my side length from the smaller one to go up top. All right, so now I have uh, my larger triangle that corresponds to CB. So I know CB is from my angle with three lines to my angle with one. So I find that over here. I see that's from E to B, and I see that that's eight, right? And you'll see why I set it up to have my smaller triangles uh, side length up top in one moment here. So now I got to solve for CB. So I multiply each side by eight, right? I have eight times five, that's 40. 40 over 10 gives me four equals CB, All right? So four is going to equal CB. I take that four there, I add it to this eight here, and then I get 12 is equal to uh, my C to E. So my answer there is going to be 12. All right, so one thing I want to point out and have you put in your notes real quick is why I set up my ratio like I did. Okay, so let's get rid of that line. We see I set it up as 5 tenths equals CB over 8. Okay, why didn't I set it up as 10 over 5 equals 8 over CB? Why didn't I do that? Well, if I was to do that, then I have to multiply each side by CB. Right, multiply each side by CB. Then I have to multiply each side by 5. You heard of this 5. Then I got to divide each side by 10. So you see how much more work that is versus this uh, setup right here. I always want to have the variable I want to solve for in my numerator because then I only got to multiply by my denominator. If I have the variable I need to solve for in my denominator, I got to do a lot more steps, okay? So that's something you should put in your notes. Anytime you're dealing with ratios, try to put your unknown variable up top in the numerator so that way you can solve in less steps. So that's really a big thing that can save you time. So that's something I would put in your notes. All right, question 19. In the XY plane, O is the center of the circle and measure angle AOB is pi over A radians, what is the value of A? All right, so keep in mind I'm solving for this here. I'm not solving for um, my value uh, in radians or degrees. I'm solving for this A here, right? So it's pi over this A radians, okay? So I got to solve for the number of radians it is, and then um, use that as a pi over uh, whatever my denominator is. All right, so what I'm looking at immediately when I see this root three and this one is I'm looking to form a triangle here, okay? So I got my right angle, it's going to be right here. I see my y value is 1, so that means I'm going to have a 1 on this side, and I see I'm going to have a root 3 as my x, okay? So you should be able to recognize when you see this right off the bat that this is going to be a 60-30-90 triangle, right? Now with a 60-30-90 triangle, um, one thing that you can know, and I'll go ahead and quick show you because it's given to us in our equations sheet, right? So you actually, you should have it memorized because it'll help you recognize patterns and save you time, but I'll just go ahead and show you right here real quick, right? So this is the circle that, or I'm sorry, the triangle I'm talking about. We see we have an x here and an x root 3 here. So immediately when I saw I had a 1 right here and I saw I had a root 3 right here, I immediately knew I had to have a 30 as my angle measure, right? And I know up top then I'm going to have a 2 because that's going to be 2 times x and I know that x is just 1, right? So immediately I know that that's going to be 30 as my angle measure. Let's go find that problem, right? So we know it's going to be 30 degrees. Another way that you could solve this is by doing a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You'd see that this is a 2, and once again, you'd see that that's a 60, 30, 90 triangle as well, right? But we saw it was going to be 30 degrees right there right away because we saw this root 3 here and we saw this 1 here. All right, so we know that that's going to be 30 degrees, so now we got to convert our degrees to radians. Well, we know 30 degrees, we got to multiply uh, by degrees in our denominator, so 180 degrees in our denominator to get rid of those degrees because they'll cancel. And we know that there's pi radians per 180 degrees. So we go ahead and do this, and we see that we're going to have, uh, we can cancel this out, call it a 1, cancel this out, and we can call that a 6 because 6 times 30 degrees gives us 180 degrees. And we see that we're left then with pi over 6. Therefore, a has to be 6, right? A must be 6. So 6 will be our answer for 19. All right, so big things to put in your notes there. Understanding this 60, 30, 90 triangle, right? You need to make sure that you have that memorized, in my opinion, because it's very, very important that you're able to recognize it without having to go back to your equation sheet and waste time. 
Also, if you didn't recognize it, you're unlikely to remember that it's on your equation sheet anyways. So you really want to make sure you have that memorized. So keep in mind, I'll draw it out real quick right here. Uh, pretend that that's a perfect triangle. Um, so we're going to have a 1 here, right, or an X, right? And then you'll have an X root 3 here, and then you'll have 2X here. This will be your 30 degrees right here, and this will be your 60 degrees right here. All right, so question 20 now. We've got a stacked equation. So anytime we have stacked equations, I'm probably looking to add or subtract to get rid of a variable and solve for the other variable. Just something to keep in mind there. So in the system of equations above, A and B are constants. If the system has infinitely many solutions, which means that they're the same equation, what is the value of A over B? All right, well, if we have infinitely many solutions, that means we're going to have the same equation. So we have to have the same slope uh, and the same y-intercept, right? So what I'm immediately looking at is since I have to have the same equation and the same y-intercept since there's infinitely many solutions, I see to go from this uh, 12 to this 60, I have to multiply by 5, which means that to go from this 60 to 12, I got to divide by 5. Okay, so I'm going to have to divide by 5 uh, this 8 and this 2 to solve for my A and for my B. So I'm going to go 8 divided by 5 gives me 8 fifths y. And then I have uh, that plus 2 over 5, 2 over 5 as x, right? So now I have a and b. So I have a is going to be this 2 fifths x, right? a is right here. a is with x, so that's going to be 2 fifths. And then we're going to divide that by, so I'll put a big division sign here. Divide that by b, which is going to be 8 over 5. So divide that by 8 over 5. Okay, another way that we can rewrite this is we can flip this 8 over 5 and multiply. So we're dividing by 8 over 5, which means we're multiplying by 5 over 8. Okay, we see our 5s can cancel and become 1, and we're just going to be left with 2 over 8, which is equal to 1 over 4. Okay, so our answer there is going to be 1 fourth. All right, so as far as big things there that you should put in your notes, uh, one thing immediately, right, I saw I had stacked equations. So at first I was guessing I was going to have to add or subtract, get rid of a variable, but then I saw that we have infinitely many solutions, okay? That told me that I had to have an equivalent slope and I had to have an equivalent y-intercept. So then I was looking at the ratio between the two. So I saw that if I divided this bottom equation by 5, that I would get this 12 here. So I knew I had to divide my 8 by 5 and my 2 by 5 to keep that same slope as well. So that's the big thing there. Then I made sure I paid attention to what I was asked at the end, which is the value of A over B. So that way I had to make sure I took those values and then divided them to get my final answer of 1 fourth. Okay, if we didn't pay attention to this end part, we probably would have answered with what A is or what B is, or maybe added them, and that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to do A over B. So always important to make sure we pay attention to that end part of our question. All right, so with that, we can go ahead and switch over to the with calculator section for problems 16 through 23 down there. So this is still an SAT practice test too. All right, let me zoom in a little bit, and let's go ahead and get started with question 16. All right, we got question 16. So question 16 says, uh, we got the results on the bar exam of law school graduates. We've got those who took a review course, those who didn't, those who passed, those who didn't pass. The table above is summarizing the results of 200 law school grads who took the exam. If one of the surveyed graduates who passed the bar exam, so we're looking at this column here, uh, is chosen at random for an interview, what's the probability the person chosen did not take the review course? So did not take the review course. Uh, well, that's gonna be seven out of our total in this column. And our total here, I'll write total, that's going to be 25. So that would be 7 out of 25. So that's going to be answer choice B. All right, we see that we have seven people who did not take the review course but still passed that bar exam. So that, that probability there will be 7 over 25. All right, so as far as tips you can put in your notes for this one, anytime I'm dealing with a table and I'm dealing with probabilities, one thing I always like to do is I always like to circle or box my column that I'm working with and then also find what my, my row is going to be, and then find that answer, then find my total, right? You saw I had to fill it in in this case, and then I kind of circled that. That way I see what I have over my total. In this case, it was seven people who didn't take the review course out of my total of 25. All right, question 17. So we've got the atomic weight of an unknown element and atomic mass units is approximately 20% less than that of calcium. Okay, so this new, um, this new element weighs 20% less than calcium, so it's going to be 0 0.8 times whatever calcium weighs. We're told the atomic weight of calcium is 40 AMU, so we're going to have 0 0.8 times 40, and that's going to give us the atomic weight of that unknown element. So we plug that in our calculator, or you can do it in your head, and you see that that's going to give you 32. So C is going to be our correct answer for 17. As far as tips for 17, 17 is really just understanding algebra and percentages. So really just understanding that if we have 20% less of something, we multiply by 0 0.8 times what we had. So in this case, it was 40 for that waste, the atomic mass of calcium. 
and then that 20% decline then gives us that 32. So that's just understanding percents is 17. So there's not a whole lot we can put in our notes to save time on that one, other than understanding how to do the math. All right, question 18. So we've got surveys taken of value of homes in a county. It was found that the mean value was 165,000 and the median value was 125,000. Which of the following situations could explain the difference between mean and median and the values in the county? All right, so one thing I wanna note here, we see that our mean is higher than our median. So if our mean, and this is something you should put in your notes because I think that it would be very, very helpful to memorize. So we know that if our mean is greater than our median, then there are abnormally large values pulling that median up, right? Pulling that median above the mean, pulling that or I'm sorry, pulling that mean above the median, pulling that mean above median, okay? Because those abnormally large values, they're gonna affect that average because that average adds all of those and divides by the total, but they're not really gonna affect that median because that median is gonna cancel them along with those smaller values, okay? So if we have a couple very, very, uh, very expensive homes, then that's gonna raise that mean home value uh, much more than it'll raise that median home value because that median home value, say we have eight homes, so I'm just going to put them down as tallies like this, right? And they're arranged in order from uh, least amount of money to most amount of money. So we'll put $3 signs to show that these ones are worth more, right? We just cancel this one, we cancel this one, 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 take the average of those two. So we see that if this home here was worth a million dollars and this one was only worth uh, $100,000, that it's really going to pull that, that mean up a lot higher, right? And say the average or the median was like all of these other homes were only worth $100,000, right? All of those first seven, but this last one was worth, say, $10 million. That's going to pull that mean way up, but it won't really affect the median, okay? So we know that what that's telling us when that mean is higher than the median is that there's going to be a few homes that are worth a lot, a lot more than the rest, right? So that's going to be answer choice C there. There are a few homes valued much more than the rest. So question 18 answer there is going to be C, right? They're not, the homes, um, home values, uh, the home values that are close to each other, it's not telling us that. Um, it's not telling us that there are a few homes that are valued less than the rest because it's telling us they're valued more. Uh, and they're not telling us that there are a lot valued between those either. All right, question 19. So we got question 19 referring to a table. So we got a sociologist chose 300 students at random from each of two schools and asked each student how many siblings he or she has. The results are shown in the table below. All right, so I've got two schools. I want to note that there's a total number of 2,400 at Lincoln School and 3,300 at Washington School. So the first thing I'm asked is what the median number of sibling is for all students surveyed. So that's going to be across schools. So immediately what I'm looking at doing is I'm going to add these together, get me 260. Then I'm just going to kind of look to ballpark this bottom part. I see that that's going to give me about 90 between both of those, about 40 here and about 20 here. So I can pretty much cancel out this first one, cancel out all of these ones. And I see my median is going to have to be somewhere uh, right in this one area, right? If I was to take away this next 110, that would put me at, we got 6150. Um, this would bring me down to that 260. So at this point, I've canceled 260 down here. I've canceled 260 up here. And I see I'm going to have a median of one right here. So my median is going to have to be one. So as far as tips for that, that you could put in your notes to help you be more efficient. One thing that I do with tables like this, I'm asked to solve for the median, is I'm going to cancel my beginning part, right? I'll add that up. See, it's 260. So I've canceled 260 from my minimums. Now I'm going to cancel the next 260 from my maximums, right? So I had 20 here plus 40. That gave me 60. 60 plus this 90. That gave me 150. 150 plus this 110. That gave me 260. So at that point, I'd cancel 260 from both sides. I saw I had to have one as my median. So that can help you save time is if you're canceling from each side with that table. All right, question 20, based on the survey data, which of the following most accurately compares the expected total number of students with four siblings at the, at the two schools? All right, so keep in mind, this is the total number. So we only surveyed 300 people in this table, okay? But there's 2,400 people at Lincoln High School and there's 3,300 at Washington. So we have to take that ratio of how many we had who had four siblings out of those 300, and we have to multiply it by these numbers. So we see that both of them had 10 over 300. So if we're trying to solve for how many total people there are gonna be with four siblings at each school, we have to take that 10 over 300, which we can simplify by taking away these zeros and get one over 30, multiplying that by 2,400 to get the number of kids at Lincoln School, and then taking that 10 over 30 and multiplying it by 
that 3300 to get the number at Washington School. Okay, so if we do that, another thing that we can do is we could take the difference, right? Because we are looking for the difference because um, we want to compare them. So if we're going to take the difference, then we see that that would be uh, 1 over 30 times 900. But let's go ahead and take a look at what our answers say. So we have A, uh, the total number of students with four siblings is expected to be equal. We know it's not because they're getting multiplied by different numbers. B, the total number of students with four siblings at Lincoln School is expected to be 30 more than at Washington School. No, we know that Washington School has more total kids and they have the same ratio of uh, of those with um, of those with four siblings. So since they have the same ratio, we know that the one with more people in it is going to have more of those students. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now we got we see between C and D. The only difference between them is how much more Washington School is expected to have than Lincoln. Now this is where we take that difference. So the difference between 2,400 and 3,300 is 900. We take that 900. We multiply that by that one over 30, and then that's going to give us that 30 students. Okay. So correct answer there is going to be C. Washington School is going to have 30 more. Than Lincoln based on this uh, study here. All right, so as far as things you can put on your notes for this one. So for this one, one thing we can do is if we're trying to find the difference, instead of taking this uh, 1 over 30, multiplying it by 2400, and a 1 over 30, multiplying it by 3300, and then finding the difference, we can take the difference between these two, which we know is 900, and only multiply that by 1, by th by one over 30 to get our answer. So that can save us a little bit of time there. All right, 21. I believe we're on 21. Yes, we are. So we've got a project manager. He's estimating a project will take X hours to complete where X is greater than 100. The goal for the estimate, the goal is for the estimate to be within 10 hours of the time. So being within 10 hours of the time that it will actually take means we could be up by 10 or down by 10. So we got to keep that in mind. If the manager meets the goal, so he's going to complete this goal of it taking over 100 hours, but being uh, within 10 hours of the actual time, and it takes Y hours to complete the project. So Y is our real. So we know that our real minus our x is going to have to be um, either 10 above or it's going to have to be 10 below. But either way, it can be within uh, that 20 point range because it can be 10 points on each side. So that can be in that 10 point range on either side of it. Uh, which of the following inequalities represents the relationship between the estimated time and the actual completion time? All right, well, our estimate is x. Our actual is y. We know that y minus x, it can be... Um, less than 10 or it can be greater than negative 10, right? It just has to be within 10 on either side. Uh, we know A is wrong because it doesn't include that either side. Same with B, it doesn't include the other side. Uh, C is also wrong. D is correct here because it includes both sides, right? It could be um, above by 10 or it can be below by 10, right? So it can be both ways there. So 21 answers got to be D. All right, next thing, immediately that uh, what I'm seeing right off the bat is I see I have a lot of variables here. I know one of my questions is probably just going to ask me to rearrange variables. I see I got a through d show me r squared, so I know I'm just solving for what r squared is going to equal based on the variables. So I'm not going to read this part or really read this part. I'm just going to go ahead and manipulate it and get this question out of the way. So that's one thing I recommend doing anytime we see a question with a lot of variables and we see we just got to rearrange them by seeing that we have a one variable set equal to the others. Now we're just going to do that. We're not going to worry about reading it because we don't want to waste time. So in this case, we got to solve for r squared. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply by r squared right here, multiply by r squared over here, divide by i to get rid of i to isolate my um, to isolate my r squared. And I see then r squared is going to equal that p over 4 pi times i. So 4 pi times i. So now I just go find my answer there. Uh, and I see that that's going to be answer choice b. All right, so we got that's question 22. Answer there is going to have to be b. So let me just go quick find this. We got 22, answer is going to be B. All right, so as far as uh, things to put in your notes there, I really just talked about it already. We're just going to find that we have R squared set equal to everything and answer choice A through D, which means we just got to solve for that. So we're not going to waste time reading. All right, in this case, it's a pair of questions, so we might have to go back and read because it's a pair of questions and we might have to know some context for this, but let's find out. For the same signal emitted by a radio antenna, observer A measures its intensity to be 16 times the intensity measured by observer B. The distance of observer A from the radio antenna is what fraction of the distance of observer B from the radio antenna? All right, well, observer A finds the intensity to be 16 times that from observer B. So just looking at my variables, I can pretty much see that I is going to be intensity over here. All right, so if the intensity is 16 times, so I'll put a 16 in for I, I'll put it right here. All right, put a 16 here. If it's 16 times what it is for observer B, um, observer A observer A observes it being 16 times that, then we're looking for this change in difference or this change in, uh, it says distance R, right? So that change in distance, what is that going to be uh, between them, right? How much further is, um, 
or what fraction of the distance of observer B is observer A, right? So how are we going to get 16? Well, in this case, we know that they're going to have the same P, the same P which in this case is uh, the power of the signal, and they're going to have that same 4 pi. So those are all constants. So all we got to do is we call them 1, right? Since they're constants for both people, we can just call them 1. So we can get rid of those. We have 1 over 1, um, and then we have 1 over r squared, right? Because this 1 doesn't do anything. So we have 1 over r squared. How do we get that to equal 16? Well, we know that 1 over 1 over 16 1 over 1 over 16 is the same as 1 times 16. Okay, so that's going to give us that 16. So then we know that r squared is going to have to equal that 1 over 16. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we're just going to square root each side. We know the square root of 1 16 is going to equal that 1 fourth. Therefore, we know our answer is a 1 fourth. Okay, so the big thing here, uh, one thing I want to talk about that I don't think I've talked about yet in this prep course is using the, what's called the factor of change rule. Okay, so since both people had that same power, we call it a 1. Since both people had this 4 pi in their equation, we call that a 1 as well. Okay, since it's the same for both people, we can call it a 1. And since we only got to solve for the, the factor that one is from the other, so one was 16 times more intense than the other, we use that factor of change rule. And the only difference is this r squared. So now we just find 1 over what gives us 16. We know 1 over 1 over 16 does. So we set that 1 over 16 equal to r squared. Then we solve for r by square rooting each side. So that's the big thing there. So 23 there, our answer is going to be A. All right, so that's going to take us through the math section for today. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and switch over to the SAT writing section for today. All right, let's get started with the writing section for today. So we're going to spend about 20 to 30 minutes with the writing section. We'll be dealing with SAT, uh, a release test from 2018 in April from the state of Maine. They released the test along with the answers. So we'll be going through this passage. I'll be giving you my insights into the SAT reading section, what I see, my tips, tricks, and advice, uh, strategies that I use, everything like that, really trying to prepare you for the SAT writing section and make you more accurate. So we won't worry too much about pace today. We'll worry about pacing later on, and we'll really work on going faster later on. But for now, we want to stay maintained on me teaching you and me kind of trying to teach you how to be accurate, why things are correct, why things are incorrect, and things like that. So with that, we can go ahead and get started with our first passage. So we have a man of many words. Uh, in 1747, the author Samuel jo Johnson announced an ambitious plan for a new English dictionary. Okay, I see I have two sentences. Uh, They're both underlined. I have a period here, which tells me I'm probably combining the sentences. I see that I'm asked to combine the underlined portion. So I have in 1747, the author Samuel Johnson announced an ambitious new plan for a new English dictionary. He did so with the encouragement of a group of London booksellers. Okay, so what I immediately see off the bat is I say Samuel Johnson up here. I'm not going to want to repeat uh, and say he did so. Okay, we already know what he did. We don't want to repeat that by saying he did so because we already know what he did. So I want to get rid of that. So then what I see I have left is with the encouragement of a group of London booksellers. Well, He's doing this, he's uh, creating this new English dictionary with that encouragement. So what I'm really going to look for there is something that says Johnson and then talks about how he does it with the encouragement of the booksellers. And then after that, talking about uh, what he does, right? So what uh, that encouragement caused him to do. So I'm looking at my answer choice to see what I got. So I got A, Johnson announced an ambitious plan for a new English dictionary and was encouraged by a group of London booksellers. Well, he was encouraged to do what? Okay, that's not telling me what he was encouraged to do. So A is incorrect. B, Johnson announcing an ambitious plan for New English Dictionary was encouraged by a group of London booksellers. Well, this encouragement from the London booksellers needs to come before he announces this plan for the dictionary because that encouragement is what led him to do it. C, Johnson announced an ambitious plan for a New English Language Dictionary. He was encouraged in this by a group of London booksellers. Once again, we need that encouragement to come first because that came before he announced this ambitious plan. Uh, D, Johnson encouraged by a group of London booksellers. Okay, so this is showing that encouragement coming first, causing him to announce this ambitious plan for that dictionary. So that's the correct sequence of events. So question 23, it's really just testing you uh, understanding the sequence of events. So we want what comes first to come first in that sentence. So our correct answer for 23 there will be D. All right, Johnson's goal was to produce an authoritative guide to the language by which its purity may be preserved. The completed dictionary of the English language finally appeared in 1755. Okay, I know that that right there is an independent clause. Its release was every bit the publishing event that the writer and his backers had imagined. That's also an independent clause. All right, so what did I see here that made me look at this as an independent clause and then this down here as an independent clause? Well, I saw I ended with a number and a comma after it, okay? And I knew I already basically said what could be a full sentence on its own. So when I saw that and I saw that I didn't have a fanboy after it, I knew if I had an independent clause after that, 
then this was going to be a comma splice, okay? Which means that this is ha going to have to be incorrect because we can't connect two independent clauses with just a comma, okay? We have to have a comma and a fanboy, right? Which is and. As is not a fanboy. And is the A in fanboy, okay? So we can go ahead and get rid of C and D there because neither of those uh, use a semicolon or use a comma with a fanboy. The only choice that does that is answer choice B. So 24 is going to have to be B to connect those independent clauses together. All right, so really big tip here is anytime that you see a word with a comma after it mid-sentence and you just read an independent clause, automatically be thinking if what comes after is an independent clause as well, then I'm going to have to make sure I have a comma and a fanboy or a semicolon. Or if that second clause is illustrating the first one, then a colon itself. All right, so with that, we can go ahead and switch over into, uh, I'm sorry, not switch over, go into 25. So we have along one's laborious journey from planning to publication, however, Johnson's Dictionary. All right, so what did I just see here? Well, I saw that I have a pronoun here. Okay, this pronoun is going to have to agree in number with whatever it's referring to. So I see that it's referring to Johnson's Dictionary, which is singular, right? And I also want it to be specific to what it's referring to. So saying ones would imply a human, but in this case, we're talking about Johnson's Dictionary. So we can't use the word ones or each ones. Okay, we need to use the word its. Now, which its should we use? So its is singular and possessive. Now, the singular and possessive form of it's is going to be answer choice D, okay? Answer choice C would be it is, okay? That's using a contraction there to say it is, and that's not what we're doing. We're using that singular and possessive. So S for singular, P for, P for possessive. So I'll actually write that out so you don't think it's plural. We need that singular and possessive pronoun it's. All right, so along its laborious journey from planning the publication, however, Johnson's Dictionary had become a book with more humble ambitions, one that no longer aspired to preserve the purity of language. Johnson had come to realize that like all languages, the English language was a living, changing thing that could not be preserved, only described. All right, so as far as uh, tips for 25, 25, we saw that we had um, a pronoun. Anytime we see a pronoun, we want to make sure that we're matching it in number. So that was the big thing there, matching it in number. And in this case, it had to be possessive as well. So we look for number and we look for possession as well. All right, now we can go ahead and move on to 26. So Johnson had begun his work in 1746, furnishing his house with several large tables and massive heaps of books. To provide examples of proper word use for his dictionary, Johnson looked to those he considered the hotshot experts. Okay, immediately I know this is wrong because it doesn't fit the tone of the passage. The tone of the passage is very academic, so if we're going to describe these experts, we want to describe them in an academic tone. So we need a word, uh, an adjective here that is academic. So the word that's academic here is going to be foremost. Big name is uh, casual. Okay, we want to avoid casualness and slang. So avoid casual words and slang words. Avoid casual words and slang words. Okay, on the SAT writing section, we want to avoid casual words and slang words. So primal, slang, big name, kind of casual, kind of slang. Foremost is academic. So we want to stay academic there. B is going to be the one that's maintaining our tone there. So B will be our correct answer for 26. So anytime that I see I have an adjective and then a list of adjectives on my uh, other answer choices as well, I'm just looking to make sure I maintain an academic tone or maintain the tone of the passage as a whole. So whatever the tone of the passage is, I want to maintain that in my adjectives. All right, Johnson read through the works of hundreds of writers. Okay, I know that this is going to have to be a comma and then marking. So how did I know that? Well, one tell, right? You know how they say that some poker players have a tell. Well, I, in my opinion, the SAT writing section has tells as well. Okay, anytime that I read an independent clause like this, Johnson read through the works of hundreds of writers, and then I see I have something like his or he, something that's repeating Johnson, then what I'm always going to look to do is get rid of it, right? Get rid of the his or he because it's redundant because I already said who it was. And then if I see I have an ing verb after it, then that's pretty much immediately telling me I want to just do a comma and then that ing verb. Okay, so in this case, B would be our correct answer for 27. All right, so that's really a big thing there, okay? You'll see this, uh, I've shown it before as well, but anytime that we have something with a comma, right, and we say his and we already said who it was, that's kind of being redundant, so we're going to want to get rid of that, okay? So if I look at getting rid of that, I can show you why my other answer choices are wrong as well. Uh, if we were to use a comma and then say and marking the passages he viewed as exemplary, marking the passage he viewed as exemplary isn't a sentence on its own, so I can't use a comma and and to connect it. Uh, the next thing, writers by, that would just create... Um, kind of redundancy. We, also, it wouldn't make sense if we were to say Johnson read through the works of hundreds of writers by marking the passages he viewed as exemplary. That by there, it's kind of unnecessary, and we want to avoid things that are unnecessary, so we want to get rid of that by as well. All right, so that shows us why B is correct, right? And then the big hint there that you can put in your notes is anytime that we see uh, that we have a subject, right, we have an independent clause, and then we have a comma, 
and then we have uh, something like a pronoun or something that's referring to our subject. We want to get rid of that because we already said who our subject is. And if we see we have an ing verb after that, we always just want to use a comma and then that ing verb. That's going to be our best fit there, right? That's how we're going to connect that dependent clause here to that independent clause up there is with that comma and then that ing verb starting it off. So that's a big thing that I look for. All right, Johnson was extremely selective in the passages he used to illustrate his work. Anytime I see I have a full sentence, Underlined at the beginning of a paragraph, I know I'm probably looking at introducing what's to come or connecting to my previous paragraph. In this case, it asks me to introduce the topic of this paragraph. So what I'm going to do then is I'm not even going to read what this says up here. I'm just going to read what's down here, then come back and answer 28 after I know what my paragraph is about. So no earlier English lexicographer or dictionary writer had attempted to define words as precisely as Johnson did. However, Johnson's careful analysis of his sources revealed subtle but inexorable changes in the way, ways words were used by different writers at different times. When the dictionary was published in 1755, Johnson's preface acknowledged this inherent mutability of language. Okay, I'm asked for a quotation that sets up what Johnson says later in the sentence, so I want to read later in the sentence before I answer that. Noting that no lexicographer shall imagine that his dictionary can embalm his language and secure it from corruption and decay. All right, well, understanding that his dictionary can't take on all of the whole language because that would be impossible and that he can't keep it so that that language doesn't change because it will inevitably change shows how uh, his preface is acknowledging that it's inherent that um, his language will eventually be mute right that it'll eventually be changed and it won't matter anymore okay so he's acknowledging that change in language so a is going to be our best answer for 29 he's not bemoaning the low status of dictionary writers because he doesn't talk about that uh, he's not explaining to the writer how he determined which words to include, so we can get rid of that as well. Uh, he's not stating quotations. He's not stating that the quotations were carefully chosen for their style and subject matter either. Okay, he's just acknowledging that the English language is constantly changing and that what he writes now may be, may be mute or uh, unheard later on. All right, so now we can go back and say what introduced the topic of this paragraph, right? Well, the big topic of this paragraph is really talking about... Um, how Johnson really studied the way that words were used and then really touching on that. So let's go ahead and see if we can find something that talks about that for 28. All right, so we've got A, uh, no change. Johnson was extremely selective in the passages he used to illustrate his work. We don't talk about his selectiveness of passages. B, it is unknown precisely how much work Johnson's scribe did. We don't talk about Johnson's scribes. We don't want to open it with how much work the scribes did. C, Johnson was not the first writer to create a dictionary of the English language. We don't talk about other writers here. Uh, or him being the first to do it, so we can get rid of C. D, next Johnson took the more difficult task of composing definitions. Yes, right, we talk about uh, defining words as precisely as Johnson did, right? No earlier English lexicographer or dictionary writer had attempted to define words as precisely as he did. He's undertaking that difficult task of composing these definitions. That's really what this whole paragraph is about. So D would be our answer there for 28. All right, and then 29, we already answered that, so we can go ahead and move on from there. So this recognition did not mean that Johnson had no opinions about how words should be used. On the contrary, Johnson used the dictionary to promote words he favored and to protest words he disliked. So A, no change is going to be our answer there. So how did I recognize that and what can you do to recognize that as well when you take the SAT? All right, well, here's what I looked for. Okay, I understood that this was going to be a tense question because I saw I had used, will use, and uses. All of those have the word used in them in some sense. Uh, so really I was looking at my tense, right? So is it going to be past tense, present tense, or future tense? So when I'm dealing with a tense question, I want to look at other verbs and see what, what they are in. Okay, so I saw I had favored and I saw I had disliked. I always want to make sure that I'm trying to maintain tense in a sentence as long as it makes sense. So in this case, everything should be in the same tense. I saw I had favored, disliked. I wanted to have used as well to maintain that past tense. Okay, so maintaining past tense there is how we got to our correct answer. So our correct answer for 30 had to be A. So anytime you're dealing with a tense question, which you can tell because you'll have uh, a had here or a will here or you'll have different endings on used. Uh, anytime you have a tense question, look around in the sentence, try to find other verbs and use those tenses as well. All right, so that takes us through 30. Now we got 31. We're told the writer's considering adding this sentence. Anytime we're looking at adding a sentence, we want to make sure it is relevant and adds support to something or connects something or provides an example, anything like that. So let's take a look. We have when it was finished, Johnson's dictionary contained 42,000 words, which made it neither the longest or shortest dictionary of the 18th century. Well, we're not really concerned with the lengths of dictionaries at this point in our paragraph, so we wouldn't really want to say anything about it. And if we read the next sentence after, we have in the definition for pictorial, a term coined by Sir Johnson Brown, Johnson described the word as one not adopted by other writers, but elegant and useful. So this is really just continuing our discussion of him promoting words and protesting words. So we don't want to interrupt that with a discussion about how many words he did or didn't use. So we're not going to want to add it here. 
And the answer is because it's going to interrupt that discussion of how Johnson used his dictionary to affect the English language. We don't want to interrupt that discussion with something that's irrelevant here. Okay, answer D is going to be wrong because it said it merely repeats information about Johnson's dictionary that appears earlier in the passage and that does not appear earlier in the passage. Okay, it's interrupting the discussion, which is why we don't want to include it. So C is going to be our answer there for 31. All right, next we got 32. So we've got by the same token. Okay, one thing here, anytime I have um, a word or a section of words followed by a comma starting off my sentence, I know that that's really me trying to transition from my previous sentence to the following sentence. So really what I do is I skip that word, right? I skip this phrase and I read what my next sentence says and then I decide how I want to connect that. So if it's something that contrasts, I'd look for something like in contrast. If it's something that is in addition to, I would look for something that says additionally. Okay, so anything like that. So I'm going to read this next sentence here. I have the word writative, which Johnson had found in the letters of Alexander Pope, was not even granted a definition. Johnson, Johnson simply wrote, a word of Pope's coming not to be imitated. All right, so this is once again continuing his descriptions of things that he values, right? His, him making his own value on words. But we saw in our previous sentence he described it as an elegant and useful word, and here he's describing it as something not to be imitated. So a unuseful word, so the opposite. Okay, so we're going to look for something that says something like on the other hand that's a perfect choice okay because that's showing it's something that's the opposite we're not giving another example or continuing on like nevertheless and we're not going to have no change either because that says by the same token and this is by a different token okay this is on the other hand we are showing something he disliked in contrast to what he liked so 32 our answer there is going to be b so anytime that we have uh, a series of words or one word followed by a comma at the beginning of the sentence i'm looking for a transition from my previous sentence to my new sentence so that's what i look for there all right, so Johnson understood that he could not preserve his language, but he could at the very least try to shape its, its future use. Okay, so I have Johnson understood he could not preserve his language. That's an independent clause. Then I have a dash here. Okay, so dash, I'm looking for two things. One thing a dash could be was uh, separating non-essential information. So if it does that, if I could take out what's between the dashes and the sentence still makes sense, then that's what it's used for. If not, then it's going to be for emphasis, right? So you'd have a dash and then something that they wanted to emphasize. So here I'll take a look and see if anything is non-essential. So we have Johnson understood he could not preserve his language, but he could at the very least try to shape its future use. Well, if I was to take out, uh, but he could, then I would just have preserve his language at the very least try to shape its future use. And that wouldn't make sense on its own. Okay, so I know that that's not going to be what I'm doing here. So I can get rid of A. Uh, once again, I can't use a dash here either, because if that was going to be non-essential, the sentence also wouldn't make sense, right? If we were to say, uh, I'll go ahead and show you what that would look like. If we were to say he could not preserve his language, try to shape its future use, that wouldn't make sense. So that once again shows that that dash in this case can't be used for non-essential. In another case, it may be used in a non-essential way, but in this case, it cannot be. All right, and this next choice would be uh, C could at the very least versus D. Uh, right away, I know something is wrong with D because I see I have a semicolon after could. We're not going to use a dash and then use a semicolon. Okay, we're not going to do a dash with something, then do a semicolon. And then after that as well, we'd have at the very least, uh, at the very least, try to shape its future use. And that's not a sentence on its own. It can't stand as a sentence on its own. It's not an independent clause. So we could get rid of D as well. Because if we're going to use a semicolon, we would need to have an independent clause after it, and we don't. Okay, so our answer there is going to have to be C. So in that case, we're using that dash to indicate an emphasis, right? We're emphasizing, but he could. And then we have commas here instead of this dash. Uh, and then that at the very least is not essential. So it would read, but he could try to shape its future use, which would work there. So that shows you why 33, the correct answer has to be C. All right, now we've got our next passage. Okay, so with this passage, I'm going to try to really go more in depth on what my insights and strategies are, try to talk a little bit less about specifics to this question. All right, so we have retailers profit from paying well. Many retailers rely on discount prices to attract customers, and these companies, executives, and managers often assume that they must maintain low employee costs to preserve these discounts. However, in recent years, several retailers have challenged this conventional wisdom. Okay, this right here. Uh, we got an adjective, right? Describing wisdom. Anytime we have an adjective, I'm looking to maintain the academic tone of the passage or the tone of the passage as a whole. Sometimes it's not academic. Usually it is, which is why I often refer to it as an academic tone. Uh, sometimes it's not, but that's very rare. Okay, so in this case, the tone is fairly academic, right? We're talking about retailers profiting from paying well. Uh, it's fairly academic, kind of an economic article. So I'm going to look to maintain that tone. Uh, conventional does make that maintain that tone. Habitual does not. Habitual is a little bit more casual. We want to avoid that. Uh, routine, also a bit too casual. And accustomed here, also a bit too casual. Accustomed also wouldn't really make sense here. Okay, we're talking about their conventional wisdom, not their habitual routine or accustomed wisdom. All right, offering better than average wages and benefits. 
Okay, then I see that I have uh, a comma and they have done so well, keeping costs down and performing well financially. All right, so a big red flag to me right away is I see I have uh, the word well. The word well is a subordinate conjunction, so I'll put sub chord, okay, for subordinate conjunction or sub conjunction, sub conjunction. Okay, with subordinating conjunctions, uh, those are going to be your well, when, uh, where, uh, why, things like that. After is another example, or even, um, although, things like that. Those are subordinate conjunctions. We don't want to have a comma before a subordinate conjunction, okay? If we just said an independent clause and now we're saying a subordinate conjunction, we don't want to have a comma before that, okay? We do not want to have a comma there. So already I know A is going to be wrong. Uh, I see C also has a comma there, and I see D also has a comma there. So I know C and D are going to be wrong as well, and I know my correct answer for 35 is going to have to be answer choice B. All right, so as far as things that we can take away from that, anytime we have a subordinate conjunction that is after an independent clause, we do not want a comma before it, okay? We do not want that comma before it. That is not allowed grammatically. So that allowed me to take away A, C, and D and solve for B right away. All right, so now we got 36. We got the cost of better compensation for employees is lower to, than many employers may realize. A 2012 study by DEMOS, a public policy research and advocacy, advocacy organization, noted that if retail workers' annual earnings were increased so that on average the lowest paid worker received a 27% raise, the additional cost to employers would amount to only half a percent uh, to total retail sales. All right, so which choice most effectively is underlining these combined sentences? We know that that's really going to be our question because we have two sentences with a period between them. All of, both of them are underlined. So if stores could increase their prices to make up for this expenditure, uh, the additional cost to consumers, if they did so, okay, this is redundant. I don't want to use that. So I'm going to want to get rid of that right away, okay, because we already said what they're doing, so we don't want to say if they did so. So I'm going to want to get rid of that. Would average 30 cents per shopping trip, hardly enough to keep customers away. All right, so whenever I'm combining sentences, I'm looking to do two things. Number one, uh, I want to get rid of redundancies. So get rid of redundancies. So redundancies, gone. I want to get rid of redundancies and repetition. Uh, another thing that I want to do when I'm combining sentences is I want to make sure I have the correct sequence of events. Okay, so if one thing's causing another, I want the cause to come first. So I want the correct sequence of events. Or if one thing happens first, I want that to come first in my sentence. Uh, another thing that you should look out for when... Uh, connecting these sentences is making sure that you have the correct modifiers, right? So you need your modifying phrase right next to its modifier. That's another thing you need to look out for. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we can do here. So for 36, uh, we've got stores could increase their prices, make up for this expenditure. Okay, that's the first thing that could happen is them raising their prices. Um, and then that cost would be spread onto the consumer. So that should come next. That cost should come next. All right, so we have A, if stores increase their prices to make up for this expenditure, the additional cost to consumers would average 30 cents per shopping trip, hardly enough to keep customers away. Yes, that's a great choice. It's getting rid of that redundancy of if they did so. Uh, it's maintaining that sequence of events of raising prices and then the consumers bearing that cost. And it also flows well into our would average 30 cents per shopping trip. Okay, so A is a great choice for 36 and A is the correct choice for 36. As far as why the other answer choices are wrong, I'm going to explain that right now because I think that it'll help you understand what I'm talking about. So B, increasing their prices to make up for this expenditure. Stores could make an additional cost to consumers that what? Well, this right here, it's very, very wordy, okay? You remember when I talked in week one about being concise, okay? We look at how long this is, and that's really wordy. We, were, we use a lot of words like uh, make up for this expenditure, okay? That's a very, very long phrase. We also have that in A, though, so that's not really the reason we're going to get rid of it. Okay, that is very, very long though, I will note that. Uh, but the real big thing here is that we say stores can make an additional cost to consumers that. Okay, well using words like that and could make an additional cost, that's very, very wordy. We don't want to use that, that's not concise. So D's wrong because it's not concise at all. Um, and then we got C, the additional cost to consumers. Okay, here we're starting with the cost to consumers. We want to start with the raising of the prices because that causes that additional cost. So C is wrong because of that. D also starts with that additional cost. So D is wrong because the sequence of events is wrong. And B was wrong because it was uh, it contained repetition and redundancy, right? Because it was so wordy. So that's why B is wrong as well. All right, now we got 37. So yeah, this modest price increase would probably be unnecessary because increasing pay at retail businesses increases sales performances. When Professor Zainab Tan at the MIT compared two chains of warehouse club stores, one with, okay, one thing I'm looking at immediately is after I said club stores, um, that was a dependent clause, okay? How did I know it was a dependent clause from uh, this prior? So this right here is a dependent clause. I started with a subordinate conjunction. When I start a sentence with a subordinate conjunction, such as when, well, after, uh, although, anything like that, I want to end that dependent clause with a comma, 
Okay, so I don't want to end it with an M dash. I want to end it with a comma. So right away, I look at my answer choices, and I know 37 is going to have to be B. So that's a big thing there. Anytime we start a sentence with a dependent clause, we need to end that dependent clause with a comma. So you can put that in your notes. That's very, very helpful. That's a grammar rule you need to know. Anytime we start with a dependent clause in a sentence, we want to put a comma at the end of that dependent clause. Another hint that could really get you to that answer as well is we see that one with better than average pay and benefits and another with lower employee wages, that's a non-essential clause as well. So we know that we have to offset it with commas. Since we have a comma here, we'd have to have one there as well. So that's another way you can get to that answer as well. So two different ways, but either way, both of them point to B as the correct answer and B is the correct answer. All right, next we got, she found that the average number of sales per employee at the higher wage club was double the employees at the lower wage club. Well, it's not double the employees at the lower wage club. It's double the number at the lower wage club, right? Because we're talking about the average number of sales, okay, the average number of sales per employee, okay? This of sales per employee is not really what we're looking at. We're really looking at that average number, okay? That of sales per employee is a prepositional phrase. When we're talking about uh, comparisons, we kind of want to drop the prepositional phrase sometimes. Okay, so if we're dropping that prepositional phrase in this comparison, we need to keep the average number. Okay, so we would say the number. We wouldn't say the employees or the ones or delete the underlying portion. We'd want to say the number. So we drop the prepositional phrase of, of sales per employee, keep average number. We have to switch to the number there. So that's how we know C is correct for 38. So according to Tan's study, well-paid workers were friendlier and more helpful to customers, and they were more knowledgeable about the company's products. As a result of their experiences with these employees, customers were likely to make purchases. By contrast, many employees at retail stores that pay average or below average wages quit each year, a phenomenon known as employee turnover, forcing these businesses to rely on inexperienced workers and to devote resources to finding, hiring, and training new workers. All right, here I see when examined, okay? That doesn't really make sense here. So right off the bat, I'm probably looking at no change as an incorrect answer. So I'm gonna read on, see what's, coming, see what's coming after. So we have the same pair of club stores that Tan studied. And then we got Professor Wayne F. C. F. Casco of the University of Colorado, and he found something. All right, well, I'm really looking at this part right here, and I think it's gonna be modifying Professor Wayne F. Casco because we have a comma here, right? So this comma is telling me that we're going to have either a modifier, or it actually is telling me that we are going to have something modifying Professor Wayne F. Caskio, because we wouldn't really start with a dependent clause and then start after the dependent clause and say Professor Wayne F. Caskio. Uh, keep in mind that uh, introductory modifying clauses, they are dependent clauses, but I was just saying dependent clause in the sense of something that uh, isn't modifying a person. Um, so an introductory modifying clause is really what I'm looking to come before Professor Wayne F. Caskio, because we haven't heard about him yet, and we really don't know why he's relevant here. So using that introductory modifying clause would tell us. So I'm looking for something that does that. So this one examined here, right? One examining what? That's too uh, broad for it to be a dependent clause. And we wouldn't want to do that, right? It also wouldn't make sense to have, then say the same pair of club stores Tan studied. So that's going to be wrong. B, uh, an examination of the same pair of club stores that Tan studied. That's also not modifying Professor Wayne F. Caskio. Uh, when they examined the same pair of club stores that Tan studied, that's also not modifying Professor Wayne F. Caskio. Uh, examining the same pair of club stores that Tan studied, Professor Wayne F. Caskio, that is modifying Professor Wayne F. Caskio because it's telling us what he's doing. Okay, it's telling us what he's doing. What is he doing? He's examining that same pair of club stores. Okay, so anytime that I have a person or a place after that comma, right, in that beginning of a sentence, so I have a phrase in the beginning of my sentence and a comma, and then I have a person or a place or a subject, I'm looking for something that is an introductory modifying clause that's modifying my subject. So in this case, it's telling me what my subject is doing. He's examining that same pair of club stores. So anytime I see a subject after an introductory clause like that, I'm always looking for a comma before that subject, and I'm looking for it to modify it. So if it's going to modify it, in this case, we wanted a verb. So that's going to be examining, or a, a verb uh, that's a present tense like that. So examining, not when they examined or anything like that. All right, now we got 40. Which choice provides the most accurate information from the table to support the author's argument? Okay, so he found that what? Well, I need to know what's supporting his argument and what comes after to finish this sentence. So if I'm going to know what comes here uh, based on the table, I need to know what's coming after it. So in this case, it says, which costs the firm an estimated $5,000 per full-time employee. So anytime I'm dealing with taking information from table and I see there's something else after, right, that's within that sentence, I need to pay attention to that. So what is costing the firm an estimated $5,000 per full-time employee? Well, I'm going to take a look at what is doing that. I see I got 5,000 bucks right here. Okay, so that's my uh, annual estimated cost of turnover. 
So I know I'm probably going to want to be talking about company A. I see that their hourly wage is significantly less than company B and that their turnover rate is significantly higher. So I'm going to look for something that talks about that. Uh, so we have A, no change. That doesn't talk about it because it talks about the lower paying club store uh, averaging $17 per hour and they average 10. So that's incorrect according to the data. Uh, B for number 40 says 44% of full-time employees at the lower paying club store leave their jobs each year. Yes, that's that employee turnover. And that's costing um, an estimated $5,000 per full-time employee. Yes, that's accurate information according to the table. And it's supporting the author's argument that these lower paying uh, companies experience higher turnover costs. So 44 would be my correct answer there. I'm sorry, B would be my correct answer there. The 44% answer choice. All right, so he found that the turnover rate at the higher paying club store, however, was lower. Um, so if that turnover rate at the higher paying club store was lower and then we're using an M dash here, we're going to try to emphasize that lower turnover rate. So we're probably going to want to say something about that. So 41 says the writer wants to include relevant information from the table to illustrate the point made in the first part of the sentence. So illustrating that lower turnover rate, which is going to accomplish this. Well, we have uh, option A, the firm's 6, 67,000 full-time employees made an average of 17 per hour. That is not showing our lower turnover rate. B, its staff at 67,000 full-time employees was significantly smaller. Once again, that doesn't touch on our turnover rate. Next, we have um, the turnover rate was lower at 17% and at a lesser cost of $3,000 per full-time employee. So 41 there is going to be C because we're talking about that lower turnover rate, which we see is 17% in this data table right here. So that's really showing that, and it's also showing that lower cost, which is proving that author's point. And it's proving the point he made in the first part of that sentence. Pay attention to that as well, because we're asked for that first part of the sentence, which talks about lower turnover rates, lowering that cost. All right, D, and it's paid full-time employees uh, 17 per hour compared with the competitors 10 per hour. That's not touching on lower turnover, so D is going to be wrong for that answer, for that uh, reason there. All right, the club store chains that Tom and Cascio studied are both successful. Okay, in this case, any time that I really have anything in my first part, uh, my first sentence in a paragraph, I'm usually looking at introducing what's to follow or connecting to the previous paragraph. In this case, it's about what's to follow, so I can't answer it until I know what comes after. So I see grocery stores, convenience stores, and numerous other businesses have been able to thrive in their respective industries while paying significantly higher employee wages than their rivals. All right, so that's really talking about how um, those club stores that Tom and Cascio studied, they're not unique, right? This is applicable across industries. Uh, we're not talking about workforces here being large. We're not talking about the size of the workforces. We're talking about how much uh, these workforces are being paid and how it's not unique to pay them uh, larger sums than the average, right? Uh, and they're not managed differently. We're not talking about that either, okay? And we're not talking about them both being successful. We're just talking about the two being not anomalies, but following a general trend, right? They're not unique. So 42, answer is gonna be C. All right, 43, uh, the success of these businesses highlight, that needs to be highlights. How did I know that? Well, anytime I'm dealing with a verb like this, where I need to determine um, my tense and my number, okay? So anytime I see a verb mid-sentence, in this case, my verb is highlight, and you can put this in your notes if you want. Anytime you see a verb mid-sentence, look to match in number. So I'll put a number sign there. You want to look to match your number and T for tense, okay? So I know I'm dealing in the, uh, the present tense because that's what I've been dealing with up here, right? We had paying, that's present tense, uh, thrive, present tense. So I know I'm dealing in present tense. Next thing I want to look at is my number. So I have uh, the highlight is referring to the success. Now of these businesses, we ignore that when determining number because that's a prepositional phrase. What indicates to me that's a pre prepositional phrase is the word of there. So I need to talk about the success, right? The success, um, the success highlights that paying workers well. Okay, the success highlights that paying workers well. Success in this case is going to be uh, singular, right? So then we have to have that singular verb highlights, singular and present tense, which is going to be uh, option D, which is highlights for 43. Okay, so how did I know success was singular? And I, how did I know highlights was going to be my singular part for that? Well, if any time that I wonder what, what verb tense is uh, which, I would use the trick of using they versus he, right? If I was going to say they highlight, uh, I would say they highlight. I wouldn't say they highlights because highlights, right? I'm sorry, they highlight. Get rid of that S real quick, right? I wouldn't say he highlight. I would say he highlights, right? Highlights. Okay, so we see that this singular matches this singular, this plural would match this plural. So automatically then I know highlights is going to correspond to my singular, and I know that the success is singular as well. So success in this case kind of acts as a collective noun as well. Collective nouns, if you recall from week one, uh, they get treated as singular 
uh, singular subjects and need to have those singular verbs. So 43, answer is going to be D there. All right, so they highlight that paying workers well uh, can be a profitable, profitable strategy for researchers. We're asked for the logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion there is that it is probable, or I'm sorry, that it is profitable for retailers to do this, right? We talk about how it lowers turnover costs, uh, lowers how much we have to pay when we do have turnover. So there's not only less turnover, but it's cheaper when turnover does occur. So that's really highlighting how it can be profitable. Okay, we don't highlight how it can be surprisingly difficult to implement. That's not what our passage is about. Anytime we're looking for a logical conclusion, we want to look at the big picture of the passage. Uh, C is one of several ways to boost employee morale. We don't touch on employee morale, so C will be wrong. D is still the subject of much debate among employers. It's not the subject of debate. And even if it was, that's not really the big picture of our passage. So anytime we're asked for a conclusion and we're not given a direction with it, we want to look at the big picture of our passage, which was about how it can be profitable for retailers to pay higher wages. So 44, answer there is going to be A. So as always, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share. Uh, if this video was helpful, there will be a donation link in the description when it's up and running. Any private SAT tutoring I'm doing will be linked in the description. Any private college admissions consulting I'm doing will be linked in the description. As always, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a great day.